Hello, guys. So uh, welcome to the uh, next session, the last session for today. And we are starting uh, by the talk, uh, uh, with the talk by Thomas Schultz. Uh, he is a professor at the uh, University of Bonn. Uh, if I'm correct, he did his PhD in the uh, Max Planck Institute. And then, yeah, you're prepared. <laughs> so I actually don't have to go through all this stuff. Uh, so maybe I just give the floor to you. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming here and giving this talk. All right. Thank you for this very nice introduction. I'm very glad to be here to have the opportunity to present a bit of the work that we did recently in the area of interpretable and interactive machine learning for medical imaging applications. Uh, so as Jan kindly pointed out, I did my PhD and my first postdoc in the area of medical visualization. But since I also got interested in some machine learning applications, um, because actually in the past 10 years, there's been quite a bit going on in this area. So this is a histopathology example for which we have already heard quite a bit uh, today. This was uh, the first example where a computer with the help of machine learning could get to the level of a human expert in a certain task, mitosis detection. And then in quite rapid succession, there have been more and more examples where now the computer can make decisions at an expert level. So other examples that have been published are detection of melanoma uh, based on uh, skin lesions. Or here, this is an example where the computer gets to uh, decide uh, how urgently a patient needs to be treated. Yeah, If this is an emergency or if it's safe, to send them home and ask them to make a, doctor, a doctor's appointment maybe in one week. And this is now also starting to leave just the academic realm. So as of four years ago, there's been the first FDA approved uh, machine for fully automated diagnosis. So now you can go to the supermarket to have an eye exam. You just sit down in front of this machine and you no longer need a trained doctor to, to operate this that takes the picture of your eye and makes the diagnosis automatically. Um, so this is, of course, a quite exciting development. So I'm coming from the visualization perspective, asking myself, well, what could visualization contribute uh, to all of this? And I just want to give you a couple examples what we tried to do at this, this interface between visualization and machine learning for medical imaging in recent years. And of course, often the first thing that comes to mind as well, to begin with, often these machine learning techniques, they are black boxes. We would like to open up this black box. We would like to see what is going on. Um, this is, for example, for debugging uh, these techniques, it's uh, quite important to be able to judge whether or not we should trust them. Uh, it's important not just that they do the right thing, but also that they do the right thing for the right reason. So next slide, I'm going to have an example. And also, yeah, you might want to use machine learning not just for the sake of making a specific diagnosis or a specific prediction, but you also might want to integrate these tools into the overall scientific progress uh, process. And then of course, it's highly relevant to be able to understand yeah, what's, what's going on. So here's from the literature, a very classical example of what can go wrong with uh, deep learning. So here's uh, an image classification task. So the machine should decide what's in the image. It was able to do so with very high accuracy, even on the test set, uh, everything seemed fine. But then using some visualization technique and attribution method, you see that it's doing the right thing, but for the wrong reason. So something that happened here, they tried to curate a big data set they wanted to, one of the classes that they wanted to detect were horses. So they found lots of nice pictures of horses, but all of them were from the same photographer who always put the copyright tag in the corner. So what the system learned to detect is not the horse, but the copyright tag. Yeah, so that if you take it away, the system no longer works. If you introduce it into this image of a car, all of a sudden the computer thinks this is a horse. Uh, this is an example of doing the right thing, at least on the data that they originally had, but for the wrong reason. And this we should prevent. For this reason, now people have invested lots of these attribution methods, and many of them work in a post hoc manner. So you take yeah, an existing computer vision pipeline, and then you try to make such a heat map that tries to indicate, yeah, where is really the relevant information? Where is it coming from? Um, 
Now, an issue that uh, with some of these methods is that uh, people have become so interested in this that they came up with many different methods and the visual explanations they give, sometimes they can be quite different Then it's a bit difficult to decide who's right. And another troubling thing is for some of the ones that have become popular, like this guided back propagation, it's very popular because it gives these very clear looking visual explanations. You clearly see, okay, this should be classified as a bird. The visual explanation looks a lot like a bird. It looks uh, like a very plausible explanation of what the network is doing. The issue is they did this experiment where they randomized large parts of the network to essentially make it do completely random decisions. And the visual explanation is unaffected by this. So then it seems like this is acting more like an edge detector on, on the image. Yeah, it gives you a very compelling uh, image in terms of being able to recognize the object that is in there. But then it becomes questionable, what does it actually tell us about how the network makes the decision? If we can destroy the network and still we get the same explanation, is this actually telling us something about the mechanism that the, the network is doing? So for these reasons, the two examples for interpretability that I want to show you, they somehow follow an approach where we try to build interpretability into the method so that we are now know what we are visualizing in the end, rather than trying to add it on top post hoc into a, a, a method that might not have been designed with interpretability in mind. And then there's a second goal. So whenever you create these methods in practice, one big practical hurdle is you need lots of data and you need annotated data. For example, for medical image segmentation, then you need people uh, who have lots of patients and go and manually segment a large number of images, very time consuming, expensive process. Yeah, maybe visualization can, can help with this and often also with proofreading. So this has also been uh, brought up earlier today. Yeah, what if you want to cl close the maybe remaining 5%? You have a method that works 95% of the time. How do we find and fix the remaining failure cases? So the main part of my talk is now mostly going to give go through a couple of examples yeah, for these uh, challenges. Um, and it's structured according to these two basic goals. So let's first look a little bit at this interpretation issue. How can we tell why a network is making a specific decision? And the first example, uh, it's going to deal with attention. And here I have, it's an example from ophthalmology, but in fact, the example is about peripheral arterial disease, which uh, Christina already introduced to us in quite some detail. And we might object, well, this is not an eye disease at all. What does this have to do with the eye? It affects more, mostly the legs. Um, well, there's a quite popular uh, idea in recent years that the eyes are not just, as the poets say, a window to our soul, but actually also a window to our body. The eyes are very easy and, and safe and cheap to image. And the idea that has become quite popular is that images of the retina, they can tell us a lot beyond disease that affects the eye, because, for example, we can image also uh, vasculature in very high detail. And this can also provide indications of systemic disease yeah, that affect other parts of the body. In particular, the underlying cause of this uh, peripheral arterial disease is atherosclerosis, which actually affects yeah, the complete body. So the idea is what the, the reason why we could hope there is signal in retinal images for this is that the same disease should also affect the arteries in the eye. And then hopefully the network could pick up on this. Uh, so this was the hope of our medical collaborators. So they collected these eye images from people, mostly from the, the early stages of this PAD, as we've heard, it's, it's largely uh, underdiagnosed at these stages uh, at this point. Um, and further, we had this idea that because right now, no ophthalmologist is able to, to do this, look at an eye image and say, okay, I think this people, uh, this, this person, from which this, this image has been taken suffers from atherosclerosis. So if there's a signal there, probably uh, it's quite subtle. It's probably about small changes uh, in the vasculature. So therefore we set up uh, a classifier in a very specific way. We made use of an idea that is called multiple instance learning. If you haven't come across this, 
this as it in general this is an idea for weekly supervised learning uh, to to learn with fewer labels so where we don't need actually a label for each individual item we collect multiple items together in a so-called bag and we only need a label for the complete bag so we just need to know is there at least one example of the disease in this complete collection of, of items? Um, so the original idea of multiple instance learning is to reduce the labeling effort. Um, and we are looking at a specific variant of this. This is called attention-based multiple instance learning. So this also learns, given this collection, this bag of, of individual items, it learns to find out which are the really important ones for making the final classification. So how can we apply it to making decisions yeah, for these eye images? Well, we cut up a, a retinal image into patches, and now we consider this original image as a collection of much smaller image patches um, and feed it into this multiple instance learning technique. So this makes, uh, there are several uh, assumptions behind this. Um, so one is that the classification does not require a larger context because all the patches are now independent. The machine has no longer has an idea really where in the eye it is. So this should only work if um, the, the signs of the disease are, are relatively local. Um, and a, a benefit of this is that it actually allows us to still use the original full image resolution. So a technical drawback of many of these classical classification um, uh, architectures is that the input resolution is quite limited, maybe something like 300 pixels squared or so. So the alternative would be to take this image and, and down sample it a lot, but then probably the, the very subtle relevant information, it would be lost. Um, so setting it up like this, we hope that it's going to have two main advantages. Yeah, first, it allows us to preserve the image resolution and hopefully the, we can pick up on very subtle variations in these vessels. Um, and second, because we now learn these attention weights for the patches, yeah, the, the network learns to attend to certain parts of the overall image more than to others. And this is really intrinsic in its decision-making. Hopefully visualizing these attention weights can tell us something about yeah, what it does, how it reaches its final decision. So I'm not going to go too much into the details of the architecture. So the idea, as I said, we cut it up into patches, then we put it into a feature extraction network. So each patch ultimately gets mapped to just a feature vector description. Then there's this attention mechanism that gets trained along uh, with the, the final uh, classification that tells us which are the relevant patches. And in the end, the complete original image, it's just represented as a weighted sum of the individual uh, feature vectors for the patches where the weights are exactly these attention values. So we can be sure if something got a really low attention value, it didn't uh, contribute to the weighted average a lot. So this is really intrinsic to the decision-making of the network now. So here are a couple of the, the results. Um, so to get this to work, because we didn't have that much training, again, it was important to do the transfer learning uh, approach as we also heard in the, the previous lecture. Um, so we also tried with ImageNet, but actually we found that it works even better to train on a task that is more closely related to what we want to do. So ImageNet is like classifying cats and dogs. It has nothing to do with eye disease. Uh, but actually you can find also on the web larger data sets of uh, retinal images where the, the task is to learn to detect, uh, for example, diabetic retinopathy. So it turns out if we pre-train on these eye images, uh, we can overall get a better accuracy than with these generic data sets. Yeah? Just because then the, the, the features that we extract from this, they are more suitable also for the, detecting the disease in the eye images that we have. Okay, so this was uh, technically one of the insights that we had that the pre-training matters in the data set we use for the pre-training matters. Um, and then we also tested this hypothesis that yeah, if there is a signal, it should be really, it should require a relatively high image resolution. It should be quite subtle variations um, in the, the vessels. So we tested this by downsampling to the standard 300 squared image resolution, which essentially completely broke uh, the uh, the accuracy, so indeed then the signal is gone. 
Interestingly, the peak was not at the original full image resolution, but somewhere around 800 pixels squared. So this might be explained by having some overfitting maybe to some noise patterns that go away if we downsample it a little bit. Okay, so these are the, the results. So to some extent now the networks can detect uh, who suffers from peripheral arterial disease just based on the retinal images. And now comes the interesting part, how does it do it? Now we can overlay here in red on top of the, the retinal images, these attention maps. We can see uh, where did the, the network focus on to make its decision. And already here, the visual impression is, it seems to nicely follow yeah, the, the main uh, vessels, which was our hypothesis. This is where the signal should come from. Uh, but of course, for such a visual analysis, yeah, whenever you have a prior hypothesis, it's very tempting to do some cherry picking and just uh, select the examples that match your prior expectation. So I actually forced the student uh, to do also a more rigorous analysis. I forced him to actually annotate all of our test images in terms of the anatomy. And then we could actually run a formal statistical evaluation on this. So this then showed us that indeed image patches that show the, the major vessel arcades, but also the optic disc, uh, they received significantly higher uh, attention weights than the image patches that did not contain these structures. Uh, unfortunately, it was not really, the, 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 the patch size was so large that you could, could not really differentiate between arteries and veins because they mostly ended up in the same patches. All right, so this is the, the first uh, example that I wanted to show you for how we tried to make one of these image classification techniques more interpretable. I think attention is a quite attractive mechanism for this because it's really intrinsic to how the network makes uh, its decision. Um, so from the application side, I think we were the first who investigated uh, trying to uh, detect signs of peripheral arterial disease based on retinal images, even though I have to say there are uh, many related papers now about yeah, other types of cardiovascular disease, uh, linking them to retinal images. They are, of course, closely related. Um, yeah, so as it's often the case to actually make this more useful and more meaningful, it would be good to have a larger data set, or is it a bit limiting to only have data from one single center? And uh, the student kindly also made his, his source code for this available. All right, so then we can look at a second example. So here we followed a quite different strategy. And also the, the goal is very different. So here the goal is not to try and make a, a diagnosis or to detect a disease. We're, we're more interested in say a scientific hypothesis about yeah, how the, the, the brain works, how information processing in the brain works. So one quite common hypothesis in neuroscience is that something that has a large impact on what a brain region actually does is where does it connect? Yeah, so the, of course the, the, the visual cortex would be connected to the eyes and the motor cortex to the limbs and so on. Uh, so this is some of the, this, the cartoon picture of this. So the goal here was to make a computational tool that allows us to uh, test the structure function uh, relationship um, computationally using brain imaging data. And of course, then yeah, this should permit an anatomical interpretation to see yeah, does this actually make sense and does it agree with previous anatomical findings. So what is this neuroimaging data? We need data now that describes brain function. We need some data that describes connectivity and brain structure. So for function, a very popular imaging modality is just functional MR, where you take repeated brain images while a person in the scanner undergoes a certain task, performs a certain task. And then yeah, the, the differences in neural activity, they map to differences in blood oxygenation, which in turn uh, in, impact uh, the, the strength of the MR signal. So somewhat indirectly, we can uh, see evidence of the neural activity in the MR signal. And if you do enough repeats and a statistical test, uh, you can actually find brain regions that correlate significantly with the task that is being done. So depending on what's the exact task in this, this work, we considered four different ones. 
uh, then you get uh, maps like this. So this is how we investigate the function side. Now let's see at the, the structure and connectivity side. So for this, we used an, uh, another MR variant called diffusion MRI. So this allows you to measure the molecular motion of water and in the cellular environment, this is actually restricted by cellular structures, especially in this uh, in these, these fiber tracts that connect different parts of the brain. They are oriented so that the water can move more freely along those tracks than across them. So this gives us some contrast that allows us to infer yeah, in, at each location in the brain, where do these fibers go? And then algorithmically, we can reconstruct uh, their overall geometry. Okay, so this is where we got the connectivity from. And then we want to link the two. Yeah? Can, the, the goal ultimately should be in one individual, can we predict when they perform a certain task, exactly which region becomes active in this individual based on observing their individual fiber tracks. This is the, the task that we try to solve. Yeah, and because the, the, the fiber tracks, they are actually the white matter, the, the fMRI signal, it's supposed to occur in the gray matter. We made these super voxels uh, of a bit coarser resolution to make sure that we have somehow uh, super voxels where we have a part of both in them. Um, and we focused on the region where we saw the, the main group activation. Uh, so it's not uh, difficult, say, for a language task to predict that certain parts of the image are not going to be, of the brain are not going to be affected. This is not the difficulty. Uh, the difficulty is to delineate exactly in this individual where in this overall region where we roughly already know the activity should be, uh, where's the exact boundary. Yeah? So we limited ourselves to this, this region around the group activation. So in this region, then we get these super voxels of interest, we ca uh, call them. And here the task becomes, by observing the connectivity of one such super voxel, can we predict did it become uh, active in the task or not? So again, in the end, it's a classification task now at the super voxel level. And uh, the main question is how do we represent the connection uh, fingerprint, yeah, the, all the, the, the brain connectivity in one super voxel? How do we represent it as a feature vector so that we can train a classifier. And here we decided, okay, already at this point, we should build the desired interpretability in. We made these feature representations based on a pretty straightforward clustering of the streamlines. Yeah, so all of the uh, first, you, you construct these uh, streamlines in correctly, uh, in, in roughly the correct location. You find out which streamline connects to which super voxel. And all the streamlines that you end up with, you can cluster them. Um, so these would be like 50 cluster centers. Um, and then you can characterize each super voxel by the relative frequency with which it connects to some of these clusters. Yeah, you can say for, for a certain super voxel, 50% of the clusters, they belong to uh, uh, the, the, the of, of the streamlines. They belong to a cluster that is shaped like this. Maybe 30% belong to a cluster that is shaped like this and so on. This becomes the feature representation, right? Here we have 50 uh, clusters. So you we tried several alternatives, but the one that is most interpretable and works quite well, you just have for 50 clusters, you have 50 dimensional feature vector, and you just have probabilities of assignments to each of these, these clusters. Um, so this is the feature representation. Now also to, to interpret this, we wanted to visualize. So showing just the uh, most representative individual streamlines, then those suffer from all the shortcomings of, of this probabilistic tracking. We found that we can get much smoother and nicer looking ones by just computing median streamlines that account for all the streamlines that belong to a cluster, not just to the, the centroid. Uh, so these are then the visualizations that we propose. Again, uh, here are the quantitative results first. So indeed, this worked in all the four tasks. You could show that it gives us higher accuracy than just yeah, flipping a coin uh, for making a prediction, but also it beats two more challenging baselines. Uh, one is what we call the probability-based baseline. So you can make just a group average atlas and say, okay, 
you can register all the brains together and say, okay, if in more than half of the training subjects at the same location after co-registration, there was an activation, I predict there should be one. Yeah, this is a, a very simple baseline. This is what's shown here in green. Um, you can make a similar representation as we did, but replacing the streamlined clusters with predefined functional areas. So you can say, okay, maybe 50% of the time it connected to the motor cortex, 50% connected uh, to uh, some part of the temporal lobe or whatever. Um, so this is predefined cortex-based approach. This is here shown in blue. And in all four tasks that we investigated, yeah, this, this clustering-based representation, it was significantly better or at least on par uh, with the others. So this is always for, for interpretation. Yeah, It's a, a necessary condition. Interpretation only makes sense if you actually have a classifier that does something reasonable. But now let's look at how can we interpret it. Uh, so now we can look at these cluster centers and we can visualize just by color coding the effect that they have on the classifier. So here the color coding is so that uh, blue means an SOI being connected to this specific streamlined cluster decreases the probability that it's going to be classified as active. Um, showing it in red shows us, okay, if it's connected to this, uh, associated with the streamline cluster, it increases the probability of activity. And what's nice is that then because these, these streamlines, they are still very anatomically interpretable, they still correspond to the well-known uh, white matter tracts. Um, we can then compare also the results from this method with results that people have previously uh, published and explored with other methods. In particular, for this language comprehension task, there has been this hypothesis that uh, since 2005, that it's mostly uh, one specific bundle called posterior acute fasciculus um, that is important for this. And then we also built on a paper from 2017 that explained how exactly you can segment all the relevant streamlines into three bundles. Here, the blue one is the, the acute fasciculus as such. Then the posterior acute is shown here in green. And uh, the vertical occipital is shown here in red. And the, the quantities that are color coded here, we can now put them also in box plots over all cluster centers that belong uh, to these three classes. And indeed, it confirms this previous uh, finding that all the, the really high correlations, yeah, they end up in this, this green class, which is what the, the previous paper suggested. Okay, so we managed to make a feature uh, description yeah, that remains comparable to what people had done before. Okay, so this was the, the second idea, how we can make an interpretable classifier. The first one was based on this attention. Now we take a different approach. We take somehow a step back from these, these deep learning techniques. And again, we engineer features. So the downside, the reason why this is no longer so uh, popular is often we can get higher accuracy yeah, by learning, using deep learning the features. The benefit from engineering them is that you can actually make sure that they, for example, remain comparable yeah, to the, the, the structures that people traditionally uh, use and, and, and think about and reason about. Uh, so for applications like this, where maybe you want to prioritize being able to gain an insight over getting the highest possible accuracy, I still think this is a strategy to be considered. So in particular, now we made these uh, clustering-based connectional fingerprints. We used them to study structure-function relationship in the brain. Um, so the, the features, they directly correspond uh, then to these streamline clusters that we can nicely visualize as these median curves. Um, and then we can just color code them or segment them according to the established methods uh, for, for interpretation. So that wraps up the two examples, the two main strategies that I wanted to suggest for interpretation. Now let's look at the second goal. Yeah, often uh, two practical challenges when working with these machine learning techniques for medical imaging um, is to provide annotations and to proofread the results. Let's briefly look at some related works for this. 
especially for medical image segmentation. Now there are very good off the shelf solutions like this famous UNET that has been, pub, uh, been mentioned several times today. Then often in practice, the main challenge becomes collecting enough annotated data actually to train these standard architectures. And this is often a considerable workload, yeah. Uh, especially in 3D data, also it doesn't make sense. It would be a huge effort and it doesn't really make sense to densely annotate them because of course, subsequent slices are very similar to each other. There's not so much information to be gained by annotating everything. Um, and even though we do have methods like the 3D unit that can learn from partly annotated, sparsely annotated data, often here the training takes uh, several days. So what we had in mind was a more interactive uh, pipeline where there can be an interactive feedback loop between the person who has the, the ground truth labeling or knows the ground truth labeling, the human expert in front of the machine and the machine trying to understand yeah, what's the segmentation it should come up with. So this is maybe easiest explained using this video. Uh, so for the sake of simplicity, these are now just uh, two classes. So you can now see we can in first, in just two slices, we do a rough annotation of the, the foreground and the background class. And then we get essentially an immediate feedback from the machine and the initial hypothesis, what it thinks uh, is the spatial extent of the structure that we're looking for. And we can quite rapidly um, correct some of the remaining mistakes, eliminate some of the false positives that it has found, uh, add some of the, the, the false negatives. Um, and this is a very quick way of building a 3D uh, segmentation, just in this interactive feedback loop. And it tells us exactly, uh, uh, interactively, where the machine actually needs more information, yeah? where, it, where it still makes uh, a mistake. So if you want to build something like this, um, of course, you need yeah, the, the visual interface as such. You need suitable uh, tools for, for interaction. You need to have display the data as such, uh, which in this case, yeah, we do, for example, with these glyphs. Um, also in our case, it's not, it was not a segmentation task where the, the classes are mutually exclusive, actually, because again, we're trying to segment uh, fiber bundles and they can spatially intersect. It's more a, a multi-labeling uh, uh, problem, um, which also in, in the user interface, then you have to account for in particular to show the segmentation, we decided to use isosurface slabs because they uh, are still relatively effective at, at visualizing these intersections. Yeah, if you use closed isosurfaces already, it becomes more difficult to, to see uh, the way in which they intersect. But then uh, to actually, for, for such a, a tool to make sense, the computer actually has to learn relatively rapidly from sparse uh, annotations that you give it. Yeah, It's only fun to use this if the, the computer picks up quite quickly based on, on a few examples you give uh, what you're trying to, to outline. So for this, we need a classifier that trains very quickly to have this interactive feedback loop, but also that gives you a decent quality. So it needs strong features based on which it can make the prediction. So in this work, I would say this was our main uh, contribution, uh, trying to make uh, both of these things happen at the same time. And for this, we propose a hybrid architecture where to gain speed, we propose to use a random forest, which is well known for being very efficient to train and evaluate. And to get a strong feature representation, we use convolutional neural networks, which are good for representation learning. They are typically slow to train, but here we did the training completely in a pre-process so that it can happen in advance of this interactive session. So then one technical challenge becomes, how do we actually design this architecture? Of course, there's standard architectures for image segmentation like the UNET, but for this hybrid approach, they are not very well suited. Yeah, because the, the UNET has a quite complex decoder. You want actually for this uh, features that are very easy to decode by the random forest. Um, and also the unit, if you actually take yeah, the complete output of the encoder, it would be very high dimensional and we want something that is much more low dimensional for the, the random forest to efficiently operate on. So we propose this alternative architecture. Uh, so it gives you just 44 
uh, dimensional feature representation, which is uh, concatenated from two branches. So here we have the, the input. So this is one slice of our data. This is diffusion MR data. So it has a lot of channels. It actually has 288 values per voxel. So what the upper branch does, it just boils down these 288 individual values to a more uh, convenient to work with 22 dimensional feature space. What the lower branch does, it adds also regional context so that we don't just get information about the local voxel, but also for the segmentation, it's quite important to have an idea what is going on in a local neighborhood. So for this reason, we have this lower branch that also reduces the, the uh, image resolution and then brings it back up again using interpolation. And in the end, we combine the two and to make sure that this relatively low dimensional feature space captures as well as possible still the information and the essence in the data, we train this as an, an autoencoder. Yeah, so that uh, we are trying to reconstruct the original data as accurately as possible from this reduced representation. And then this reduced representation, it is fed into this interactive classifier. So this is the main idea. And here are now a couple of results uh, that should convince you that it's a good idea to use this representation compared to a simpler one, which might be obtained using, for example, principal component analysis. So up here, this, these are the segmentation results that we would like to achieve. And then you see uh, with two, uh, in, in, in both of these examples, we use exactly the same annotations, exactly the same amount of human effort for labeling. Um, with these learned features by the network, we get much higher quality results than with the standard PCA features. And this is also reflected uh, in the, the numbers in the table. So you can evaluate this also, or we evaluated this also in a small case study where we actually had uh, an experienced PhD student, gave them eight minutes uh, to reconstruct a specific uh, 3D structure, either with the CNN-based features or with the PCA-based features. So all the markers that have been set within these eight minutes, they are shown here in yellow. So already you can see that for the PCA features, the poor students had to fight a lot more against the machine and put a, a lot more markers to correct its errors. And this is also reflected in the final result. So even uh, with the, the CNN-based features, we got a much nicer looking uh, final result. And also if we quantify the accuracy, it's much higher, even though you only had to set half or so of the, the labels. Okay, so this is... The first example for the interaction, one idea in which we, how one strategy to follow to reduce the annotation effort by setting up this interactive loop. Um, so the main idea is that by making this into a, a completely interactive process, it should allow the human annotator to immediately focus on the regions where the machine is still making an error and not waste time, provide lots of redundant annotations in regions that the machine is, is getting correctly uh, anyway. So technically to make this feasible, we propose this hybrid approach, which should still be fast. So this is what the random forests are for, but still as accurate as possible. This is why we use CNNs for representation learning. Um, and some future directions that I would like to explore is actually once individual uh, initial annotations come in, it could be quite nice in the background thread to start and refining the features. So, so far we just retrain the random forest, but maybe as the, the interaction is going on, we can also make stronger features based on them. And it would be quite nice to transfer this also to other types of, of high dimensional volume data. So, so far we only tried it on this diffusion MR data. So then I bought one more example, and this time for proofreading. Also, this has been brought up previously uh, as a problem. Now, many of these automated techniques are quite successful. They work in the vast majority of cases, but what about the few remaining failure cases if we also want to fix those? How can we do this efficiently? So the application example to motivate uh, this is uh, age-related macular degeneration. Now this is properly an eye disease that affects the eye. Um, 
So this is a simulated example, yeah, how your vision changes with age in case you suffer from this. And uh, to diagnose this, uh, a standard method is to take a three-dimensional image of your retina. This can be done using an imaging modality known as optical coherence tomography. So you essentially get these slice images of your retina in the healthy retina. It should be a layered structure and all these, these layers should essentially be nice and parallel. Uh, as you have this, as this age-related macular degeneration sets in, yeah, some cellular debris starts collecting here and we get these elevations of the pigment epithelium layer, uh, these bumps that uh, they call drusen. So quantifying them is a way to detect and track uh, the, the progress of this disease. And in particular, our collaborators, they specialize in epidemiology, meaning they have huge amounts of these data. They have thousands of these 3D data sets and going through them manually and quantifying these Drusen manually is completely out of the question. Yeah, it's, it's infeasible, the manual effort. So the first thing they asked us, well, can, can you do this automatically for us? We made a couple of examples. Uh, can you train a machine learning technique that does it automatically for us? So this is the first uh, challenge that we tried already in, in 2017. Um, we tried three different approaches. This is uh, briefly the one that worked best. So we used some, uh, again, unit architecture to first um, segment out the different layers. And then by post-processing the layers, we were able to detect these anomalous elevations of this RPE layer and quantify the reason. So this allowed us to build a little bit of prior knowledge into this and it worked, this pipeline worked better than a, a pure end-to-end uh, -end data driven pipeline. And at this time, a couple of years back, this was actually the first approach for this specific task that used deep learning. And of course, by a large margin, it, able, uh, it was able to, to beat uh, the, the previous method that had not yet used uh, deep learning. So that was nice. The collaborators, they liked it a lot. They started using it, for example, to evaluate uh, effectiveness of new experimental treatments that they tried. Then they could take, uh, af at, at, after certain intervals, again, these 3D images and use our software to quantify how did the Drusen uh, develop. Uh, they also used this uh, and, and correlated this with uh, visual function measures. So they could actually show that then the overall Drusen load that you have in the eye the higher this is, the poorer the vision becomes, as you can find out by using some standardized tests. Uh, so in terms of this quantification, that was quite successful. But then I was actually also interested in looking at the remaining failure cases, yeah? Because even if you have a method that works like an order of magnitude better than what the people had before, still it's not perfect. Still there are some remaining issues, in, especially in cases of, of advanced AMD, Often the image contrast becomes very weak. You get these very weakly uh, outputs of the network. Uh, it is not that uncommon that some of the, the Drusen uh, are being missed. So what if we want to detect and fix those, those few remaining failure cases? So for this, we thought that, well, maybe uncertainty visualization can help us. So we thought, okay, how can we detect, automatically detect these problematic images where maybe some uh, errors are still or might still be present. And we thought there are two uh, natural ways to tell this. One is directly based because the, the network gives you a probabilistic output is based on directly looking at the probabilities. Yeah, if in a certain location, the network was very unsure what should be the segmentation, then probably there's a higher risk that there's an error there. But also another quite natural type of error that could occur in this context is that within the same image column, you have multiple responses with a high probability because based on prior knowledge, we know that the layer needs to go from the left to the right. It has to cross each, each column exactly once. If the network has a strong detection in multiple locations, also that uh, type of uncertainty that we should account for. So this you can quantify using entropy. By, by using column normalized uh, probabilities. So then empirically, we try to find out, okay, are these uncertainty measures that we defined, are they valid? Do they correlate actually with true segmentation errors? 
which we either ranked just by manually inspecting the results or also by comparing them quantitatively with the ground truth annotation that we had. And well, both of them correlated similarly well with the errors and we got the impression that combining them gave us a slight advantage. So in the final uh, visualization tool that we made, we decided to uh, display both of them. So we just color coded them differently. So uh, an important feature of the software is that it, it allows very efficient navigation within these three dimensional data sets. So you have this navigation bar here at the bottom, which just color codes these uncertainty measures. So you can very quickly see where are the, the slices that are likely to be affected by a segmentation error. You can very quickly go there. Then we see the same color coding on top of the segmentation itself. Yeah, where is the, the, the problematic region within the specific slice? And once you found this, also by working with intermediate representations of this, the segmentation pipeline, uh, we came up with some interaction tools that should make it uh, easier to fix this. You know, for example, these constraint shorted paths, uh, if you as a user just specify uh, one location, for example, that uh, a retinal layer should go through, then it's very easy to condition on this and find the most likely overall segmentation that agrees with this constraint. So this was one of the, the quite powerful uh, ideas. Another one is if you correct manually a layer segmentation, probably the neighboring slices, they should be affected as well. So it's several of these techniques that we built in. And then uh, just using two users, we try to get an idea how big is the benefit of this. And in these experiments, we found that for uh, finding and fixing to a pre-specified level of accuracy, um, these, these segmentation errors, we could save roughly 50% of the time uh, for fixing the, the retinal layers as such. And once they have been fixed, finding the drusen, here we even saved between 70 to 80% of the time. Okay, so at this point, I just want to mention one uh, yeah, uh, open research challenge that I've since become a bit uh, concerned with because here for this uncertainty visualization tool here, we mostly relied on the probabilistic output of the network itself and visualized that. And something that now has me uh, quite bothered is that often these probabilistic outputs as such, they are not reliable at all. So one situation in which this is particularly severe is if you have a difference between the scanning device that was used to acquire the training data and the scanning device on, on which you want to, to make the prediction. So here's just a, a practical example. These are head MRs from six different scanners. As humans, we see that they are, of course, the, the image characteristics, they differ a bit. But to a human, maybe the difference is not that dramatic. Yeah, If I teach you how to segment the brain, also a quite simple task, out of one of these scans, probably you as a human can still successfully do the same task on the other, uh, on the other scanners. Uh, unfortunately, this is a, still a remaining failure case for many of these uh, deep learning techniques. So if we now train with images from one scanner and try to uh, apply on images from another scanner, often we get very wrong predictions, even though the task is, should be quite simple. Here you see that a whole part of the brain is missing. And what's even worse is that in this scenario, the network is very sure that this should be the correct answer. Yeah, it's not able to detect its own mistake at all. So this happens easily with these, with these uh, changes to the scanner. So this is a problem that it's not necessarily a this problem per se, but this is a problem that uh, I became interested uh, more recently. And then with another PhD student, we are now looking into strategies uh, to fix this. But I don't want to go too much into the details because I said this is no longer really a this problem. So instead, let me conclude about this, this final part. Uh, so I think, yeah, uncertainty, this, the, the proofreading here is a really nice example where uncertainty visualization can really help by saving a lot of time, by drawing the expert's attention to the uncertain cases, to the cases that are likely still to contain errors. And then you can also combine it maybe using these, these intelligent tools that make use of intermediate parts of the, the segmentation pipeline. But still for these 
things to work reliably, it's really important to be able to quantify uncertainty in a reliable way. And this, I would say, to some extent, it's still an, an open but interesting research challenge. So with this, I think I can thank you all for your attention. And I also want to thank, of course, uh, the, the, the first authors of the four talks uh, that I've presented uh, today. And I'm quite curious about what your questions are going to be. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Thomas, uh, for a great talk. Uh, let's start with the questions. I already see uh, one over there. Uh, fantastic call. Thank you very much. I was just wondering about uh, future work for uh, segmentation or guided segmentation for 3D for 3D volumes. Mm -hmm. Did you already consider that to apply that to connectomics data? And if uh, you, you know, if you thought about that, uh, what do you think will be the challenge uh, to apply? You know, the that you know that framework and that uh, mm -hmm. and that pipeline uh, on this kind of data. Mm -hmm. Okay, so connectomics is somehow an overloaded term. People use it for different in different contexts. Uh, in particular, also for the type of data that we are using. Sometimes people call it connectomics because you're actually trying to find connections, so this is some more macro scale connectomics. I guess, yes, you're talking about actually tracing the, the connections at the cellular level. There currently, we don't have annotators. Uh, we don't have collaborators who, who deal with this, this type of data. So I haven't looked specifically uh, into this. Um, so the specific architecture that we developed here, it's specifically intended to be used with high dimensional volume data, where at each location uh, you have a larger number of, of, of values. I think the, the data that you are referring to, it's mostly scalar, right? It's just scanning electron microscopy. Uh, so there, I would say this, this architecture, at least it's not directly applicable. Uh, maybe more for the other people today have talked, for example, about MR spectroscopy. This could be a more suitable uh, application yeah, where we also have high dimensional data. Uh, any more questions? Uh, I would first of all like to thank you for the talk. And I would have a question regarding the patching algorithm uh, mm -hmm. described in the uh, learning process. So, yeah, exactly. Um, I was thinking that perhaps by introducing these patches and only feeding these separately to the uh, network, mm -hmm. there may be some scenarios in which, for we'll say, a blood vessel continues from one patch to another. And incidentally, some patches are connected spatially one to each other. And if this would in turn induce some misclassification if there wasn't some kind of jittering of the patches to remove um, perhaps some of the potential errors that might, that might occur. Okay, so the, the patches in this case, they, they are disjoint, they don't overlap. So at least we don't have any structures or any locations that would occur in more than one patch. I'm trying to understand now your, your question better. So, so where do you think the, the, the exactly the, the error is going to be introduced? For example, at the edges of each patch where mm -hmm. there's a vein or blood vessel. Yeah, so so when, it, when there, there's one blood vessel yes. that crosses yes. from this patch to that patch? Yes. Um, so what I hope is going to happen that then both of these patches are going to be weighted as being relevant by the network. And both of them independently uh, are going to be mapped to a feature vector that then the decoder can yeah, understand that it's related to, to peripheral arterial disease. Um, I mean, of course, you're right that one limitation of the way that we set it up is that the, the classifier this way, uh, it does not have any information about the relative position of different patches. So in case it should be important um, 
is this the specific vessel part of the, the upper or the, the lower arcade or so the, the, the network doesn't know. Um, so for this, yeah, also something that has become quite popular recently in computer vision is to use apply also these transformer architectures also to vision problems. So this is in a way related uh, because they also yeah, cut up often the images into patches and then use those as tokens for, for the transformer. And there you can bypass actually this limitation. Yeah? It's, it's, it's somewhat similar because they also use attention, they also use patches, but actually the transformers, they typically have some positional encoding also, which we don't have. So the, the classifier knows where a patch is from and they allow an interaction between the patches, which we don't. I would be quite interested to see honestly how such a, uh, an architecture does on this application, but my gut feeling is that we might not have enough data to, to, make it, uh, to take advantage of this. Because also these, these vision transformers, they have been shown to be extremely data hungry. Yeah? So even in this original paper, they say, well, ImageNet, it's not a large scale data set. It's not sufficient to learn from. Uh, and here we have, of course, uh, much, much fewer examples than, than ImageNet. Um, so I agree, it could be interesting to explore approaches that allow interactions between patches, but we have to keep in mind that uh, somehow the, the, the database that we have right now, it's, it's quite limited. And if you go to some some really fancy techniques, it's very easy to, to overfit. And as a continuation to this problem, uh, which may or may not be a good analogy, is for example, solving certain captures in which we have, for example, a, a street crossing and we need to check each box where there's a um, red street light, for example. And in this instance, let's say each box would represent one of those patches, yes? Um, again, I'm trying to make sure I understand your question correctly. So you're saying if, uh, again, if there's a structure that crosses multiple patches? Exactly. So yeah. if there's, for example, a red street light, which is delimited by the patch exactly in half, mm -hmm. would this system then um, detect correctly that in both patches there is that street light present? Ah, um, I would say that there's there's no guarantee yeah? because the all that the, the, the network is trained to do is to make the correct prediction based on the overall collection of patches. So if it's able by focusing on just one of the patches to already get to the, con uh, to co the, the correct conclusion, there's no guarantee that it's also going to give attention to the other one. I'm not sure if this was your, your question, but, but this is for sure, yes, uh, I would agree, yeah. Thanks very much. Okay, are there any more questions? It's, I guess it's just that I don't understand it well enough. So Thomas, please bear with me. But in your second example, mm -hmm. where you uh, uh, developed your, your, yep. your features, I was wondering to which degree um, this you need this focusing on the super voxel uh, that you know will include the, the signal. Mm -hmm. And what would change if you wouldn't do that, if you would st uh, start with all, all of the data? Ah, uh, so, yeah, so so right now I'm limiting myself to this overall blue region. So exactly, the, the yes. light blue, this is the, the group activation, yes. and then I'm uh, at this margin yes. around it. Yes. Um, so you're asking if I wanted to make this prediction for the complete brain. If you if you wouldn't do that, if you if you would not just focus on the dark blue mm -hmm. super voxel here, but but. Uh, uh, omit that step and, and work with the entire data. the entire brain. Yes. Do you think you would get false positives, or uh, the, what, mm -hmm. what? What do you think would be the consequence, or is is that not no problem at all because you have this data anyway, and it's it's no no burden or no no extra cost or something? We haven't tried it, uh, so I cannot say for sure what is going to happen. I would guess that the accuracy that we can report in the end, the numbers. Should be much higher than the ones that we have right now 
because the task actually for uh, th then you include lots uh, a large part of the brain where you can be very sure that it's not going to be activated so this should really drive up the accuracy so in my opinion by including the whole brain you make the task a lot easier i think you get get much nicer looking numbers so we actually made the, the size of the margin so that it would be a roughly balanced task so that in the end roughly Half of the super voxels are going to be positive, half of them are going to be negative. So you don't think you would get additional clusters from, from your... Um, yes, yeah, so I think a, a, a main reason why it's attractive to do this is right now we're actually focusing on the largest group activation. If you have something, an effect that is very distributed across the brain, probably it's more interesting to look at the, the complete brain Technically, yeah, because here we're using SVMs, there's a technical limitation that then the, the size of the training data set goes up and they don't scale that well in this sense. Maybe you would need another classifier that scales better then. Uh, so you would have to modify this a bit. But I think the, the, the feature descriptors, Well, if you want to scale up to the complete brain, probably it also makes sense to consider streamlines then from the whole brain. So then also you would have to scale up the feature descriptor and it would become a lot higher dimensional. Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's becoming more messy. Yeah, you're right. Thank you.